My name is David Lehman Miller. Um, you saw my name in the credits. I was part of the crew that went down last May term, so 2017, to film this documentary. Um, and I'm now in a position with the Community Resilience Guild who is putting on these events. Um, so this seemed like a great connection. Um, so maybe we can start by going down the line um, and introducing ourselves and what our connection to this film was. So why, why are you here? Why did I ask you to be here? I should turn it on. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Riley Mills, and I was also part of the class that went down to Layton, Florida last May term. Um, I'm a recent graduate with a communication degree, and I was the producer, director um, of the film, heavily directing more towards the, the second unit of the production. Um, so yeah, that was, that was how I was involved. My name is Kyle Hufford. I teach at the college in the film and uh, video production program, and I also run Five Core Media, which had a big hand in this. Um, so this class, uh, it was actually two classes that put this together. Uh, we've done this model a few times where we have a class during May term that will do the production work, and then we have another class that does the post-production work. So we had an advanced post-production class in the fall, this past fall, that actually put the film together. And then um, in the spring, uh, Five Core Media kind of did some brush up work on it, um, did just some finishing touches on it before we had a premiere. Um, I think the premiere was in April, um, I believe, on campus of this. And so, so yeah, that was my role. I'm Ryan Sensenig. I teach in the biology department. I've been going down to Florida since 2008, often with my colleague Jody Saylor, who will I guess I just introduced her, but she'll introduce herself in a second. Except for that trip. Pardon me? Except for this trip, <laughs> exactly, which we'll learn more about in a second. So um, I'm an ecologist and a field biologist and enjoy getting students involved in research projects. So uh, Kyle and I, I think, started this conversation. Kyle came and approached us in the biology department about whether the story of the Marine Station would work well for a documentary, maybe two and a half years ago, if not yeah. three. And so, um, was eager to kind of collaborate with the comm department to, to make this happen. I'm Jody Saylor, and I also teach in the biology department. And most of the time, I teach genetics and cell biology and small things. But marine biology is the one time I get to talk about big things. And <laughs> Ryan lets me come along, so it's great. <laughs> So I think a great starting point for this conversation would be what you just brought up, Ryan, about how this uh, documentary came to be um, and what those initial initial conversations between you and Kyle were um, about why you wanted to make this film. And then from your perspective, Ryan, about how would this add value to what you're doing um, to the program or to the research? Um, I, can, I can start a little bit um, on that. So... I, I've done this a few times um, with classes um, and taken an interdisciplinary approach um, to a project. Um, we have the great fortune at Goshen College to have a May term where we get to do these very focused, three-week intensive um, kinds of projects and um, also off campus. and. Uh, you can do so much in that that you can't do sometimes during a semester where you have 50 minutes three times a week or 90 minutes twice a week. Um, you have such an intensive amount of time together working on one thing, um, and that is such a great benefit. So I did this um, a few other times. One time, actually, Twyla was on a, on a trip that we had done to Kenya. Um, and David, you were on that trip, too. And um, we got to do it then. It was kind of the same setup. We, we did, um, that time we did, actually, it was three courses that put that together. Uh, this time, again, I wanted to do another inter interdisciplinary approach. Uh, we had this great facility in the marine uh, ecosystem in the Keys there, and just thought that was the perfect fit and such an easy thing to do. Well, as long as they were okay with it. Uh, such an easy thing to do since it was the... Goshen College's own facility. Um, and I also knew that um, the biology department has um, X number of slots available for that class for non-majors. So 
going into this like, well, what if the non-majors were comm majors? And what if we did this project as a part of this alongside the biology students? And it'd be just a great opportunity for um, the biology students to learn from the comm students as well, not just the comm students learning the biology part of the thing. And so you kind of have this cross-pollination, to use a biology term, um, uh, <laughs> uh, going on. Um, and it was, it was just, it was, it was a really fortunate opportunity. Um, these are great colleagues to work with. Um, and I, I think the students really benefited from that opportunity as well. Not only did they get to do a cool project, but they got to learn something they wouldn't have learned anyway. I did not go down for the course this year, as Kyle was alluding to earlier. Well, this year I did, but the year the film was shot. So I'll let Jody tell you about that level of collaboration. But from a departmental perspective, what intrigued me about the possibility of the comm department telling a documentary is ever since I arrived at Goshen College, I felt like I was walking into a story. Uh, alumni would come back for homecoming weekend and they would tell stories about, oh, I remember back in such and such year when I was down in Florida on marine biology and we did this, that, and the other. And so it felt like there was this long kind of legacy of marine biology education, which you learned more about tonight. And it, it begged to be told in a way that uh, was accessible to, to future students and prospective students, and even to celebrate our alumni connection. So when we began the conversation, we were also in the throes of planning some new curricular initiatives in our department, and that being a semester program down in Florida. So for the first time starting in 2020, um, students at Goshen College will be able to enroll an entire semester. And we're only able to do that by collaborating with a, a pretty well-known marine biology program at Old Dominion University, which is in Virginia. And so, you know, I'm a Savannah ecologist, so I don't really have any right to teach marine biology. And I surely don't have a right to teach an entire semester of it. So I've been learning marine biology uh, the last decade. And we thought, you know, to raise the bar, um, we really want to collaborate with an R1 school that's doing kind of cutting edge research, uh, nationally known research. And so we think it's a bit of a coup that we have this great facility and big old Old Dominion doesn't. And we have students who are really keen to study marine biology and could benefit from collaborating with them. So on the heels of uh, that discussion came Kyle saying, hey, why don't, why don't we tell the story? And I thought, well, this is perfect timing because we're trying to launch a new initiative and we're trying to connect it to the history and the old initiatives. And um, yeah, it, it feels, I feel lucky to be kind of here at this time at Goshen and excited to see what uh, comes about. But in terms of, I, could Jody talk a little bit about the course itself? I think it would be fun to hear more about that. Yeah, and I'd, I'd particularly, be, particularly be interested to hear about how the course w felt different to you leading it with only bi biology students and then having the six of us film students there as well. Well, I guess for me, the thing that was um, so fascinating is that I go into my courses thinking about the content and the skills and like the things that we want our students to be able to know and to do. And for the first time, the comm students got me thinking about our course as a story, like a story. I, I just was like such a new um, concept. And I had such a great time, and I think all of our biology students too, having to think suddenly about lighting and sound and um, the editing process like blew my mind as well. And it's been really fun uh, for me. I can't speak for all the biology students. But for me, it was fun um, to watch the comm students. We were all sharing our work the whole time that we were there. So they would hear reports about the research that the biology students were doing. And at the same time, we were getting to see little three-minute clips of short films that they were putting together from their footage. And then seeing those short pieces, and then now to see this into the full-fledged um, documentary was pretty, it's pretty, it's amazing. Like, I'm amazed at what these comm students did. It's fabulous, really fabulous. So I guess I didn't feel in a way, um, so it was a new way of looking at the course, but I felt like the course as far as the community that we built um, and the experiences that we share, that was the same. Like, that's something that just always is kind of the magic that happens on the marine biology trip in the May term. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the course is always, uh, there are always majors and non-majors that are a part of the course. And so 
we're doing everything together, living together, eating together, working together. And so it feels like a big family by the time we finish that three weeks together. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit more about kind of the experiential nature of the course. That was a kind of a buzzword that came up a lot during the film. And maybe you can start with you, Riley, as a student experiencing the experiential nature of the course. Um, what sort of, I mean, I, I know there's a lot of different things that you could say here, but the, the value that you get out of doing, I mean, it, it's, it's a course, it is a class, but really what you're doing is making a half hour documentary. Um, which is not the traditional way that film classes work. Um, so if you could, what was that experience like? What do you think you gained out of going and doing it as opposed to studying it in a more traditional sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think something really important about storytelling that oftentimes, I mean, when you read a book, you know, you can only get so much from is that it's very rarely in documentary storytelling your story that you're telling. It's never your story that you're telling, really. And so getting down into Leighton and experiencing this, I mean, we went door to door. I mean, we knocked door to door looking for people to talk to. And so that's something that you could have never gotten from a textbook. And, and working with a crew as well is very, very different from working on your own. So it's, it's delegation and it's, you know, facing obstacles, not alone, but with other people as well. And so I think that not only was it, you know, an adventure and storytelling and learning how to sort of find the story that's there, because it wasn't always just waiting there for you to find, you really had to dig for it. It was also learning a lot about a subject that I, I mean, I was not good at science in school. I mean, I'm a comm major for a reason. And so I think that, you know, going down and, and hearing other students be really passionate about what they were studying. And also, you know, we learned right along with them. I didn't know what terrestrial meant. I thought that was a science fiction term. So I was like, wow, these are really, you know, this is a very unique opportunity to expand beyond beyond what we are are there to learn where we're also sort of absorbing what everyone else around us is doing as well so that language of absorbing i think it was mentioned in the film like from dawn till dusk they're immersed in marine biology um how how do you see that I'm talking to the science professors here, manifest in the students. Like, what do you hear from the students after the marine biology course that you wouldn't hear from them after one of the courses that you teach on campus? Well, I have heard a couple times <laughs> students say, every course ought to be like this. Like, this is what learning is. This is what teaching is. Like, every course ought to be like this course. Which is always good to hear, but <laughs> I guess. But, um, I yeah, I would say, typical of other field classes, um, what marine biology does is it kind of infuses students with a whole new way of, of thinking about an area of the world, a, a worldview shift that, you, similar things you get on SST or a trip to Kenya, where you, you couldn't rewire the way you look at the world without being there and smelling it and tasting it and as you heard Jonathan Roth talk about, you know, being frustrated with the mosquito bites and the pain of, you know, it looks a little glamorous from the video, but we, we work hard while we're there and students are fatigued and tired and sometimes grouchy. And, you know, that whole community, can we do this thing together? Um, there's a certain sense of we've been through it and we made it and we're proud of the research we've done and we didn't think we could do it, but wow, you know, we learned 50 species in a short amount of time. We can identify them at will or almost at will. And we developed a research project. So there's a certain amount of, of um, I think, extra energy and extra attention that it breeds among students that that uh, they kind of wear as a badge of honor and feel proud about when they're done. And I would guess that's typical of, of most field classes or immersion classes, classes like even uh, the class you were referring to, Kyle, going to Kenya. I'm always amazed, and actually I was really impressed. I, I went down twice. I went down 
uh, two years ago just to kind of check out what it was like and just to see what it was going to be like the following year when, when I took a class there. And it always amazes me. And even in the, in the trips I've done abroad, other trips in May term, it always amazes me how much, how little students complain about the work. Um, like in a traditional like fall or spring semester, you know, you give an assignment and they have a couple of weeks to do it and you'll, they'll, they'll complain about it. Like, but here they're working well more than 40 hours a week, sometimes 80. Like they're not thinking about it that way. You know, because they're having fun, they're focused, they're they're kind of in the moment, and um, you know, and it's it's all about the project and or or whatever they're studying, and and so that's that's the part that I've always liked about major, and and getting off campus is it just totally changes the culture of the learning environment that you're doing. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit more about the film itself now. And what you see looks like, I mean, it is a, a polished product that's a half hour in length. Um, but that's not what we shot when we were down in Florida. We, we shot, I think, over 20 interviews. We had hours and hours of footage. Um, and Riley, I know you were a big part of coming back to Goshen with all of this content and saying, what now? What do we do with it? Um, what is that process like? How do you begin to find or create a story um, when you have maybe too much to play with? Well, I think you know, with any story, you have identifiable themes. And so I think the first step was figuring out what all of the themes were, which there were a lot, <laughs> and a lot that you didn't see here. Um, and, and it was also, it was, you know, when you're in the moment and you're doing the interviews, there's a lot going on. So while you're thinking about maybe your questions, you're also thinking about what's the lighting like? Is my camera on? Is there audio being recorded? And so you don't really remember everything that was said necessarily. So it was a lot of time spent at the electric brew around the corner. I had printed off all of the transcripts of the interviews and I sat down with a highlighter and I went through and pulled out all of the things that... Yeah. I, I walked by the brew one time and I saw Riley with a stack of papers. <laughs> <laughs> About a foot high sitting next to her going through with a highlighter. It was as intimidating as it sounds, but, <laughs> but it was a really good, it was a good refresher um, of, of sort of what, what all we were trying to cover, not only with our questions, but what people wanted us to know about the community. And I think that it started off being very different. I think that's the thing about documentary storytelling is that it always starts off one way, but because you're not telling the story, it ends up incredibly different. And so for us, the challenge was, <clears throat> is this about education? Is it about history? Is it about the environmental impact that this community is is seeing daily and and trying to combat and so i think the challenge was trying to touch on all of these subjects but not be also overwhelming um and and of course you saw what we what we ended up with and i think there was a lot more to the story that we wish we could tell but it's and that's that's the hard part too is having having your baby and saying I have three hours worth of things that I want to say, but no one wants to sit there for three hours and hear what you have to say. So it was I think it was a really um, it was a good challenge and something that we faced all the way through post production. I mean, even when we were editing, even when we had a full cut, it changed again and it changed again and it changed again. So it's and it still feels like it's not done, even though we have a polished product. You know, I was sitting back there and Kyle leaned over and he said, I keep seeing things. I keep seeing things. And I'm like, you can't change it now. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, it could have. One of the things about documentary storytelling is the purest form of storytelling. Um, and there is inherent bias. And so it's, it's, it's a process of like weeding that out. Like where is that inherent bias? And it's hard to get away from some of that. Um, 
you know, one of the inherent biases that we were dealing with with this story was it would be very easy to make this a rah-rah promotion of Goshen College marine biology program and just that that's all that it's about. Um, but, you know, I, we wanted more. We wanted more out of the story. And so when we got down there, it just I, I did push the students a lot. Like, well, what's the story within the story here? And kept challenging them to look at uh, the latent community as a character in the story. And how do we flesh that out a little bit more? And how do we, how do we tell the story of the connection between the community? Um, you know, because it'll, it'll make a more dynamic, it'll make a more interesting story um, that way. Um, and like Riley said, it's, it, it changed so many times. There's so many interviews we have. We have a very interesting interview with the mayor who has, has nice, colorful way about him. Um, <laughs> and that we actually had in the original cut some segments, but it just didn't, like, we weren't going to show any more, so it just didn't make sense to have a little bit of him in there. Um, so it's... It's it's interesting. It's it is a very unique kind of community, and so we really wanted to show that. We could have easily just focused on the marine biology, you know, facility right there in our program, and um, but we did want it to be more. At the same time, we didn't feel like we had the expertise or time really to go into a lot of the environmental factors. Um, of what the students were studying or, or what we were seeing or experiencing. We just didn't feel like we had the credibility behind us to like really go in depth into that part of it. This wasn't, this was, this wasn't going to be chasing coral or, um, what's the one about plastic? Um, plastic ocean. Yeah. I think plastic it's called. ocean. Yeah. It wasn't going to be that. Um, originally I thought maybe we could do that. Maybe we could focus on a little bit, you know, maybe the lobster population or something like that. But, it just, it wasn't gonna work out that way um, in the context of what we were trying to do. Um, so at this point, I think I'm gonna, we're gonna change directions and talk a little bit more broadly than we have been. Um, so I'd like to give you a chance if you have, if anybody has a question that's a little bit more specific, um, particularly about the filmmaking process. Um, otherwise, there'll be times for questions at the end as well. I'm curious about you. Who do you see as your audience? Who you, who you were making it for, what you intended to tell them, and that would be true for the scientists as well as the filmmakers, and what do you hope in two years <coughs> your audience is looking at and doing with this? Um, it's hard to make it. It was, it was going to be hard. It, that is another struggle that we had. Because it was gonna hard, be really hard to make it super general, like general for an all like all audience kind of situation. Because we were still tied to the Goshen College story itself, but how did we make that interesting enough to where if you didn't have a connection to Goshen College, you might still want to watch it? Um, and that was like one of the first days that we were there. I mean, that was the challenge that I laid out. It's like. You know, consider an audience that doesn't know anything about Goshen College as much as possible. Um, and, you know, I think right now it plays really well to the local community, to alum, to people that went there, to even like, e even there's a, there's a whole group of people that travel down there through Goshen High School and through other um, institutions that go there. And so that would be interesting that would be interesting to them. In a few years, um, hopefully it's still interesting to current students to be able to see what it's like. Um, for, you know, another offshoot of this project was was a promotional piece that we did for the new program, um, for the new program, uh, the semester long program. And so, you know, that was another byproduct of this project is that we produced this other piece. Um, that will hopefully help grow the uh, the department, help grow the college in seeing these experiences that uh, students have the opportunity to go to on. Yeah, I think for me, the audience was decidedly folks connected to the college, particularly alumni and prospective students. Um, I was also surprised how it kind of generated some excitement and conversation among current students. And they got to, similar to what Jody, I think, was saying about telling the story while you're immersed in it, 
um, our current campus, I think, got to realize, hey, I didn't, wow, this is unique. Kind of took it for granted. It's pretty amazing. And so um, what got me excited in the beginning is, again, reiterating what I was saying earlier, that, that I, want, uh, I want alumni to see themselves in this story and to help move it to future chapters. And so as someone who's charged with trying to grow the program and recruit students, and um, those are audiences that I care about. But I think you guys did, uh, echoing what Jody said, a masterful job on the documentary standing alone, unrelated to Goshen College. I mean, the footage is outstanding. The text was great, the narration. I mean, so it's a piece of uh, an artistic work in that sense, too. But it still could fulfill some of our internal goals, I think, really well. Yeah, I think as a from the student perspective, going into this, it didn't. I think the goal was for it to be more than a promotional piece, and I think that in many ways, it fulfills the role of being a promotional piece, and that's that's sort of the content that we have, and that's what worked really well. And this was a class of students, especially in the post-production process of storytelling, that didn't necessarily go on the trip with us. So there are many elements to this that were, when we talk about the environment, maybe we are not experts, but also the people in the community. Um, one of the comments was, well, I'll be dead by the time I see any of this really impact the area where I live. So it's kind of this mentality of, I see climate change happening. I see the coral reef dying, but I don't really have to worry about it because I'll be gone. And so I think that that as well as, um, I, I think that there were many elements to this that didn't quite get covered. I mean, it's also, it's a community, there's the Lane Baptist community, which is a very uh, conservative leaning um, faith base. And so that really, had an impact on the community as well as wh how many, what kinds of people were welcome in that community and the language that was used. I think that there were many elements that could have been explored but also would not be appropriate for a college promotional piece. I mean, and so you really, the challenge is saying what is going to be most beneficial and what can be used um, to do the most good versus what's the, I mean, you can point out the little things that you have, but really, it, it, it's really challenging. That I think that was probably the hardest part, especially as a student is saying, especially a student from Goshen College is saying, I'm, I kind of have to leave these things out, even though to me and to a lot of people, it's very, very important. Um, but staying honest to what the program is and what it provides, and it does provide a really good connection with this community and it provides students with an opportunity to mingle and mix with people that are very different from themselves. So. And that's a good example of our, well, in, in this case, editorial bias. You know, we chose not to show some of the more ugly sides of it because we knew the multiple purposes of it. Um, right or wrong, it's, it's just a reality of storytelling. Um, of what the story that you want to tell, and maybe certain things don't fit that narrative um, of what you get. Um, and so you have to choose sometimes what you show and what you don't show. So as an older person here and remembering Frank Bishop, I was so glad that they recognized John Roth and Frank for what they did. You know, I mean, I didn't even quite really, I knew they initiated, but I didn't really think about all the work they had to do to get that to continue. So thanks for making that a real important part of it. Yeah, yeah there was a lot of like hopping around the keys for a while. You know, the, the hearing the story of like how they ended up settling where they did was, you know, and we didn't, and there was more of that story that we could have told. Um, you know, and, and even when we were at the alumni event at Homecoming this past fall, this is after we pretty much shot everything. I, I, I heard stories I hadn't heard before at that alumni. I was like, oh, that would have been great to, like, put in there. Um, you know, stories about Frank and John and, and stuff. So, 
Um, but yeah, sometimes you have to like, well, and then the hurricane happened too. And we really thought long and hard about, do we make this the epilogue? Do we now alter the end of the story and, and show this aspect of it? And it was just going to be so hard to do. You know, we were in the middle of trying to finalize it. We, it, it was just, it was going to be way too difficult to do. I wish we could have done it. Cause I think it would have, I think it would have, you know, hit home some of the climate change stuff and some of the, the fact that, uh, you know, this ecosystem is very vulnerable to nature, whether it's, whether this is an effect of climate change or not, you know, the seas are warming, um, which makes hurricanes more powerful. But, um, you know, this whole area was more vulnerable and actually Leighton didn't get hit too hard and partially because of some of the initiatives that they had done when they had planned that community. So there's, there's a lot of mangroves that help protect it from, um, some surge, storm surge and, and whatnot. And so it, it fared a little bit better than just down the road and, in, in marathon. So, um, yeah, but so, again. So Ryan, you've been down since the hurricane to do some cleanup, then also to teach again this year. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the effects that you saw? Um, yeah, sure. Kyle's um, right that Leighton kind of dodged the bullet. Um, south of Leighton, about 20 miles, 15 miles, is a town called Marathon. Marathon got hammered. Um, you know, trailer parks gone, houses gone. Um, Though there are these small regional effects, storm surges were complex, depends where you were, the wind shear was complex, how much mangrove community, plant community you had around your house did affect it. But I think largely Leighton dodged the bullet just because of the storm path and, and where the storm went through. I went down in November with my kids. What Kyle's not telling you is probably part of the reason he didn't put any of the the hurricane um, story in the documentaries. He sent a camera along um, with me when we went down to do cleanup. And he said, hey, while you're doing this, that, and the other, you know, get some footage. We might put it in the, we might put it in the documentary. So I gave this camera to my two 14-year-olds. And then I said, you guys, you guys, you're the camera people, and I'm working. And I think he probably got next to nothing out of that experience. So, <laughs> so that's part of the filmmaking challenges, right? Our facility had about two feet of water in it, and we have had to make some significant changes due to FEMA regulations about how we can use the, the ground floor, which is, you saw photos of our lab. Um, the upstairs portion is fine. That doesn't need any modification, but we're in the process now of trying to figure out how we, how we can get a new structure to have a laboratory space because we're not allowed to use the, the ground floor anymore um, uh, as you can't dwell in it. So no bathrooms, no office space, no air conditioning, that kind of thing. So it, it, the hurricane has definitely shifted our programmatic thinking about long-term plans, and we're trying to creatively think about uh, this as an opportunity, not as a setback, and I'm excited about that. But So while the direct hit of the hurricane was something we we didn't notice a whole lot in this course, I don't think the students, I mean, I had to point out to them, hey, this used to be all mangroves here, and hey, there aren't sponges here that used to be here. And, but I think for many of them, they probably wouldn't have noticed a whole lot of major damage around where we were. Um, so the, the theme of climate change, you mentioned that was not the direct focus of this film. Um, it is much more the direct focus of the next film that we're showing, Chasing Coral. And that film isn't as much about the science of climate change as it is about the storytelling of climate change. They talk about, you know, this is a promotion problem. This is a marketing problem. We have this community of scientists that really have it pretty well figured out. Um, you know, there's not 100% certainty. There never is with scientific models. But there's a pretty solid understanding of what's happening, pretty solid understanding of why, um, why it's happening, and then different models that project with a fair amount of confidence what could happen going forward. And yet the general public understanding is a long way away from those scientific understandings. So that's really what the film Chasing Coral is about, is the communication gap um, and the storytelling. So I wonder, I'd open this up to any of you. Um, 
about the role that storytelling and communication and messaging and language can play in translating some of this scientific research um, that's being done. Well, I, I'm always telling, I'm always stressing um, that this is how we learn. Um, and this is how we pass on knowledge is through story. Humans are hardwired for story. Um, it's, it's so innate. We understand it um, without having to think about it. Uh, it's sometimes the most effective way to communicate something is through story rather than just fact. Um, and, and sometimes, no offense, Scientists are really good with the facts, which is good. We need those kinds of people. Uh, we also need good storytellers to kind of take the fact and like structure it in a way that um, those of us without PhDs can understand um, sometimes. And, and, and that in and of itself is um, um, being storytellers for, you know, for those who um, maybe even like lack those skills, you know. Um, I mean, it, it's a little cliche sometimes that we tell like, you know, you know, be be the storyteller for those who can't tell stories. Um, I think there's a better way to say it, but I forgot it. But um, um, so, but that's what we're stressing here is is that, and that's why I love the interdisciplinary approach because you're not, you're not searching for a story. I mean, the story's already there. And it's, it's learning how that um, you can bridge gaps and you can cross, you know, we can go into the science building and not get kicked out oh. and, <laughs> and not feel like we don't belong. Like we, there's, there's a place for everyone in, the, in, in this learning ecosystem. Yeah, fascinating conversation. I, 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 I think the view of science from the outside feels like sometimes it's not what I experience from the inside. And I think science is very much about story and very much about paradigms and worldview. And I think it's more about language than it is necessarily about whether you do story or we do story. I think we both do story. But it, I think it's about language, and, and often language, we use very different words meaning the same thing. A very quick story about this. When I moved to Goshen for an interview, I probably told this story to my students too many times, but it makes a good point. Um, I was at a hotel getting ready for my interview, and I sat down for breakfast, and I was nervous as all get out. And I, it was my first job interview, and I was trying to figure out how in the world this was going to go and trying to get my thoughts together. And a guy plopped down next to me for breakfast, and he said, do you mind if I join you? And inside I was thinking, yes, I do. But sure, no, have breakfast with me. Perfect stranger. This is great. And he said, why are you here? And I said, I'm interviewing at Goshen College for a job in ecology. And he said, oh, you don't believe all that stuff about climate change, do you? And I'm thinking, wow, what, what kind of community am I joining here? And I started to think about how I was going to respond, realizing I didn't have time to go into. It wasn't a science argument he was bringing up. He was bringing up a worldview argument. And I could tell from his previous comments that, that he has a, a strong faith background. And I said, well, what's your view of human nature? Like, do you think humans have a tendency to sin? I, a word I thought he might resonate with. And he said, oh, absolutely. And I said, well, then, you know, given enough time, don't you think humans might mess the planet up a bit? And there's just silence for the rest of breakfast. And I, <laughs> I could go on, get ready for my interview. And I think it, it was a way in an odd sense for us to connect just by using really different language than we're normally used to using. So I think that's what we got to work at, trying to find common experiences where we learn how to talk to each other a little better. Yeah, I think the connection um, coming from a non-science background for me is just the curiousness. Like storytellers, your job is to be curious. Scientists, your job is to be curious. You're always looking for more. And so I think that often sparks the conversation. I mean, and, and that's where understanding is built is because you, you have to meet each other 
halfway. If I asked you to explain something to me, you wouldn't you wouldn't speak to me the same way that you would another you wouldn't speak to how you would speak to Jody. <laughs> I mean, and that is and that is perfectly understandable. And so I think that that is really the connection that I found especially amongst students there or I never felt like like I was not an equal or that we were ever having issues communicating with one another. You just sort of develop that naturally through your ability to be curious. And so that's my take. I felt like while we were there, there was also a, a bunch of excitement um, that the science students had to show a new audience what they were finding. And they were re always really excited to show us things. And then in return, we were excited to show them what we were working on. Mm -hmm. um, so just like to mention that. Um, Jody and Ryan, I'd like to throw you a bit of a curveball. I didn't mention this question. Um, but if we could, or actually maybe I did. Anyway, um, thinking about a deep dive course, that was the name of the film, and in many ways that's what the marine biology class is, is a deep dive into this ecosystem. If we could take that in reverse and think about a group of students from Florida coming to the Midwest, um, oftentimes we're kind of numb to what's going on immediately around us because it's not new and it's not exciting and it's hard to hang on to that curiosity. So what would a deep dive into Goshen look like? <laughs> Jody, Jody was born and raised here, so she understands this part of the world really well. Well, I think some exposure to the terrestrial system would make some sense, wouldn't it? And maybe the agricultural um, history in this area, too. Um, I think it's always interesting. Well, we even had some good conversations during the course when we were uh, filming. Students who came and they kept saying, well, I don't understand why I don't see more people composting and why don't more people have gardens in their backyard. And I was like, well, this is coral. I mean, where, what are you going to grow on coral? Um, so I think, you know, just realizing, like, you can't always take the things that work in your spot, right? And it's going to automatically transfer somewhere else. And so I don't know. I don't know what kind of things those... Uh, marine students or whatever from Florida would uh, find interesting or different about thinking more about terrestrial life here. I don't. I don't know. It's a good question. More cows. More cows. Definitely. That's probably a big one. Oh. Right. The sea cows. The manatees. Right. I bet they would be shocked to realize how much the, uh, really what you're saying, I think, Jody, the ecological landscape, the way it looks now, isn't the way it was, or even should is not what I mean, but maybe should. <laughs> um, you know, that we were 45% wetland, and uh, the, the, the forests were almost all clear cut. And I bet to a Floridian coming here, it looks all green and grown over and beautiful and majestic, and I think they'd be surprised to dive into the kind of environmental history. So I'd, I'd like to close by thinking about the idea of the resilience. I'll bring it back to the Community Resilience Guild. And one of the ways to think about resilience is as personal resilience. So when obstacles come up, being able to adapt, change around, and overcome. Um, so I think for the filmmakers, while we were there, we had a ton of obstacles. After the fact, we had a ton of obstacles. It's an uh, eight-month process putting this film together. Um, do you have any reflections on the, the resilience, the dedication that it took to put this project together? Um, it, it was, even though this, is, this echoes what happens in the industry a lot, it, it, that you have a different set of people filming a project versus the people that then edit the project. Um, other than a handful, it was all different people. Uh, Riley saw it through, and I think two others saw the project all the way through from start to finish. Um, and, so, and so you're bringing a whole set of other people on board to the story. And, and, and in a lot of ways, that's good because you're getting different perspectives. You're like, well, this doesn't make sense. Like, it makes sense to us because we were there. Um, but you know, and so that gave us a great perspective. It, but yet at the same time, a little bit of a hurdle to overcome. Um, trying to edit this in a very small. This was their final project for that class. So they didn't work on it the whole semester. They only worked on it for like 
November and part of December. Um, and then we worked on it a little bit after that. But so like that's a that was a huge hurdle. Like how do you get a half an hour thing edited uh, when you know nobody's working on this full time? Um, so uh, that that was probably the major ones for us. The planning was it wasn't really that difficult to plan it. Um, it wasn't too bad. It was well established, like the process of going down and what you need to do, what you need to bring, and all that stuff. So that wasn't too bad. So. We did have to figure out the underwater filmmaking, though. That was that was a huge hurdle. Like, how did we, what do we do with that? Like, um, you know, how do we capture some of that? So we we, we had some action cameras, kind of like GoPros. They weren't GoPros, but they were a different brand. Um, and then we also had an underwater housing for one of our other cameras. So we had actually researched and, and bought a housing for one of our other cameras so that we got uh, some better shots out of that. And then we got there and realized like it was so bright you really couldn't see the screen, so you were just kind of blindly shooting most of the time with that thing. Um, it, we practiced at the pool. At the pool at the yeah, we did. Uh, we did some training at the middle school pool prior to going, um, uh, about a month before going, and tested everything out, made sure nothing leaked and and all that. Um, so. Um, that was interesting. Um, the pool was much colder than the ocean, turns out. <laughs> so, uh, Yeah, so I think that coming from the perspective of this being a class project, it's like if you sit down with a paper and let's say you spend eight months writing a paper, you are going to be so sick of that paper. You are going to be ready for it to be done. And this, I think that oftentimes with filmmaking, it's not so different. And so there comes a point when you have to, you have to find your enthusiasm. And so especially being someone that was a part of this from start to finish, there were many points where it was like, man, so is it done yet? I mean, we got to be there soon, sometime. But I think that, um, yeah, so I think that part of the resilience is you kind of have to, at least for me, I found myself always reminding myself of, of the community and the people who we spoke with and the people who would be excited about these stories and who were looking forward to seeing those. And so knowing that it wasn't, um, it wasn't about you and how tired you were, it was about all of these people that took time out of their days to give you information and to point you in the right directions that kind of made, um, I think myself and many of the other students more resilient to maybe the fatigue of spending such a large amount of time on one project, so. So when I think about the marine biology program through the lens of resilience, what really jumps out to me is that it is how much it's adapted and changed and evolved through the 50 years um, that it's been in existence. That's kind of one of the definitions of resilience is change is necessary. If you don't change, if you don't evolve, um, eventually something's going to come along that wipes you out. Um, and now we see the program evolving again with the addition of the marine biology major, with the addition of the semester program. Um, so I'd be interested to hear about that evolution of the program um, and what it's taken to for the small Midwest college to be able to sustain a marine biology program for 50 years. I think p part of that um, is why I was so excited about the documentary because the, the, the story tells itself to a student who goes and experiences the trip. They come back and they get it. They're like, oh, man, that, that was kind of a life-changing experience. But it, it is kind of amazing how you walk around campus and you brush shoulders with colleagues from other disciplines who haven't been there, and they're like, so, should we still be doing that? Like, what's going on down there? Or, you know, it's so far away. It's so distant. It's not a part of the everyday rhythm on campus. And so I feel the need to constantly be storytelling about the program. Like, this is what's going on down there. Here's what we're trying to do. Here's why we think it's important. Um, when I arrived, I, I think there was, we were at a low point in, in understanding how to keep things going. And um, I think there was talk of, of maybe selling the facility. And, 
And so we kind of rallied the troops very quickly my first two years here and um, started conversations with ODU even that long ago and started to really try to re-articulate to the campus, this is why we're doing this and this is why we think it's important and this is these are the outcomes and this is the curricular initiatives we're doing, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I felt um, things ebb and flow all along, but I almost always feel the need to try to, I don't know if you feel this similarly, but to try to continually restate, this is, this is our Southern campus way down there and this is what's going on. I think it was, um, well, I guess just as the, um, what do I wanna say, as the faculty change over the years too, I think it's been important. And the way that the program began, it was more of like natural history sort of course, right, of the marine system. So memorizing the organisms and knowing the organisms that were present in the system. But having Ryan come on and being an ecologist, it was a new way to think about it and to think about all the connections, right, between the different players and to think about this larger story of climate change and how all the different pieces are connected. And it made it more relevant in some ways. And we've added more research, which I think is really important. Our students are desiring that. And it's becoming more important as they're preparing for their careers. And so I think that's great. And now we've got this opportunity to be working with graduate students and faculty at ODU. And so I think I think just the, the way we keep adding new people and new expertise to the program is really important for sustaining it as well. So that, that idea of relationships and connections as resilience, I think for us at the Resilience Guild, that's probably the most common way that we talk about relationships as the, I mean, uh, the most common way that we talk about resilience as the quantity and quality of relationships. And I think that's true for social systems. Um, and so I think we can see that with the marine biology's relationship to the town of Layton, but then also in ecological systems. Um, you know, if you, no matter how strong any individual species is, if there aren't those relationships, the, the system's going to collapse. Um, I don't know if you have any reflections on, on the relationships as resilience, um, either social or ecological. Well, <laughs> from the social systems aspect, um, I thought that one of the really common things that we were hearing back from both the students and the community while we were there was that they really wished that they had more interaction with one another. And so while those systems have existed for a very long time, the connection has somewhat, you know, dissipated over time as well. And so I think that we had a really, um, really wonderful opportunity to come together as a community and as a program. Um, we had we hosted an open house where the community came in and they were able to look at all the specimen and talk to the students and it was a really wonderful um, way f to kind of reconnect and really make, um, I don't know, strengthen that bond that has pre-existed the students and the people that live there. So. I would actually uh, follow up with what Riley's saying too. I think it, um, like we know the history and like the relationships that were so important, but of course as John Roth retired and Del Layton passed away and all those that were so important to begin the program, um, it was, it's been hard. It's been some challenges to kind of stay connected to the Baptist church down there at times. And so just, it's a good reminder, like it was a great reminder having, you know, hearing from the film students that the community really wants to be a part of what you're doing here. It was a great reminder and just, to, you know, to keep remembering to reach out to each other and that, yeah, that there is this history, but we need to keep building that connection. Yeah, yeah I, I would agree wholeheartedly. We had a, um, a premiere showing of the film this last course that I taught in May term and invited the local community members and gave out free DVDs as door prizes and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we, we were walking down the street. The, the premiere happened to be two days before Linda, you saw her in the film, her, um, her grandmother died. And so the week before, and so the funeral was on Saturday, we were leaving Friday. We had our open house on Thursday. 
And so there were family of the Layton family in town for the funeral. And we were strolling down the street, coming back from our night snorkel, looking all soggy and wet, tromping down the highway one. And a guy riding a bicycle stopped us and said, are you from Goshen? And we said, yeah. And he said, um, I am Del Layton's great grandson and we're here for the funeral. And I just, just have so much respect for the Goshen college program. And we heard about your premiere showing and we're planning to come and, and he stayed with his, his, um, his friend and talked with the students for like an hour and a half during our little open house. A lot of the community members couldn't come because they were getting ready for the funeral. Um, but I think you're right. The, the strength of those relationships is there and we got to keep working at who the new players are and how to build those, uh, those relationships in even stronger ways. Um, we have a couple minutes left if anybody in the audience has a question or if you have any questions for each other. Can I go back? <laughs> Are you going to make another film? Or? Ooh, uh, sure. <laughs> all right, then I, I think we'll wrap it up. Um, thank you all so much for coming and agreeing to do this and for bringing the film. Um, you can buy a copy of the film outside if you want to. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, we'll be back here again in two weeks to do Chasing Coral. Um, a bit of a spiritual follow-up to this event, if you will. Um, so yeah, thank, thanks again, and hope you have a good night. Drive safe.